So I'll let uh, the three of you introduce yourselves very briefly. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, Andrew Brooks, uh, co-founder and CEO of a company called Smart Things. Uh, we're building what's uh, an open Internet of Things platform. And so what we're designing to do is basically build a user experience for consumers to make this approachable so that the smartphone becomes basically the remote control for everyday, everyday objects uh, in your life. And then uh, also provide the tools, the connective tissue, and the platform uh, for developers, for makers, for inventors to basically add additional devices to this network uh, so that the, the new devices that are coming on board uh, are part of a, a connective tissue. And uh, I'm Stuart Lombard. I'm one of the uh, founders of Ecobee. And um, what we're trying to do is, is, is really we started the company with a, a simple question, which is how can we use technology to help um, people conserve energy, save money, and reduce their environmental footprint? And so our first product is in the um, heating and cooling space, and, and we allow you to connect uh, your thermostat uh, via Wi-Fi to the internet. Um, and why that's important is because 50% of your home energy use is heating and cooling. And so um, by managing your heating and cooling better, you can have a significant impact on the environment. So I went out and I spent uh, $26,000 on solar panels. Uh, I have those on my roof. And I'm having a competition right now between my solar panels and my Ecobee, which cost me $200. Um, and my Ecobee is actually winning. And so when you look at you know, how do we as a community, how can we have big impact, um, it's really about, you know, small things can have a, a big, big, a big, big difference. And so um, that's what we're trying to do. Great. Keller? Um, so I'm Keller. I'm uh, a co-founder at Remotive. And we build robots that use uh, your smartphone as their brain. Uh, so we are geeks growing up. We, we uh, watched Star Wars and Star Trek and always basically figured that robots would make our lives awesome. Uh, over the last 20 years, uh, since I started watching Star Trek, uh, Robots have done very little to make my life awesome. It's a big disappointment, basically. And uh, the reason is that robots are so expensive and complicated that they're really only used in factory. They're used in factories and then academic labs. And so, basically, 0.0001% of the human population has access to um, a technologically powerful robots. Uh, and if you wanted to, if you wanted to, from scratch, create a robot that is uh, Wi-Fi enabled and computer vision capable, those robots in the past have cost between 25 and $50,000. So we, didn't, we couldn't afford that a couple years ago. We needed to build a robot that was a lot cheaper that we could put personally afford, and so we built Romo. So Romo is uh, a robot that, so this is my personal phone. I can plug it in. It'll automatically download the software that I need, um, and Romo will come to life. So he is a, uh, a creature that uses computer vision to figure out what's going on around him. He can figure out how humans are feeling, and he can empathize with them. Um, or, or, or he will be able to. Uh, he, he, we basically are trying to turn him into a trainable robot. So he is uh, a robot that anyone can program and anyone can afford. Uh, kids and adults alike can teach him to do new things. And then you can control him from uh, uh, any iOS device anywhere in the world. And it streams two-way audio and video. So this means that uh, you can literally you know, pull out your iPad in the Hong Kong airport and log into a robot at home and go from room to room like uh, saying goodnight to your kids or uh, interacting with your dog during your lunch break at work. So, Thanks, Keller. Mm -hmm. So we're going to run through some demos. Uh, and you can now see why these three gentlemen are here around the connected home. Um, Andrew, we'll start with you. Um, and we're going to try to uh, stream these demos up on the screen so hopefully everyone yeah. can see what's going on. So uh, there's nothing like connected demos uh, and going first to see, uh, see how this works. Um, so I'm actually running this on my personal hotspot off of the phone, back to the hub and back. And, Andrew, do you want to tilt your phone just oh, a little, yeah. little bit? Uh, a little more? Nope, too much right there. <laughs> too much? All right. There I also go. didn't know I was going to be a hand model, so um, hopefully that'll work. Uh, all right, so what I mentioned, what we're building, the first thing you have to do to make the Internet of Things real for consumers is you have to actually create a user experience that is, that is rich, that turns this mobile device into, uh, again, kind of the remote control for everyday objects in my life. And so you can see this is actually my home, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move through it. I can see, you guys can't really see from the color density, but uh, those are my kids in the upper right-hand corner. Their little, their little tiles say they're not there right now. That's good. They're at school. Um, I'm not there either. Uh, you know, I can see what's happening uh, with my front door, what the temperature is, is it open or closed. I could lock it, unlock it. Uh, you know, I can come down and see uh, in my garage here. Uh, it looks like my wife is, uh, should probably turn off the LinkedIn notifications here, but uh, looks like my, uh, my wife's car is not there, so I'll, uh, 
uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see about uh, actively opening the garage door here. Uh, and uh, that way I won't get a nasty text from her saying to, uh, to, to stop doing stuff like that. So that's gonna open up the garage door at home. But I also brought uh, a couple of different devices here locally. So you can have devices in a second home. I could have devices here. Uh, this one is the, the Strictly Mobile Conference, which I've got a few of these devices around me. So you can see for uh, any of the Game of Thrones fans, I'm actually here. That's me as Khal Drago for uh, Halloween uh, last year. So uh, a, a, an appropriate winner is coming reference earlier. But uh, you know, on the stage, it starts with very basic stuff, right? So basic status information around, as an example, there's motion uh, on this motion sensor. Uh, or if I deal in, drive into one of these uh, multi-sensors, the fact that that's now open, the fact that it's active, because it also has a three-axis accelerometer in it, so I can know if it's moving around. It's got a temperature sensor in it. Uh, it's got uh, angle and space, so I can actually put that on a garage door and not, you know, not only know is it open, but uh, how much it's open. And that gives you some very basic information, and uh, things like notifications start to be valuable. For us, a notification is the starting point of something called a smart app. And smart apps are the software intelligence that then the developer and maker community can layer uh, on top of this ecosystem to start to create some real magic. So I've actually got a, uh, uh, I think on this, uh, this light here that I've got turning on and off behind me, uh, I've got a simple smart app that basically says during what I'm calling the demo here, if I move into that demo mode, uh, this same open and closed sensor that before was just providing uh, open and closed status is now gonna you know, turn on and, uh, and then ultimately turn off, uh, turn off that light. And so those are very basic smart apps, but the concept of how does this software become predictive starts to be very powerful. So as an example, there's a smart app that I run at my house, which is good morning routine. And what that means is when there's motion detected in a certain area of my house after a time of day, I want the house to emulate how it looks when I set that up. So you start to have some predictive intelligence that says, Andrew at that time of the day wants to have these lights on, these outlets on. He wants uh, to not be in secure mode. Motion over here doesn't matter. He wants his children's lights to start slowly coming up so that they can wake him up, et cetera. And so the power of what we've built from a platform standpoint is you start to get developers who are building that type of richness into the ecosystem. And so we, uh, we launched our product on Kickstarter back in the fall, and we asked the question, wouldn't it be smart if, and we got 2,000 answers with people filling in the blanks to that question, wouldn't it be smart if uh, when uh, a thunderstorm is detected in the future, uh, I can turn on the music and turn on the lights so that my dog doesn't get uh, anxiety and, and freak out and damage the carpet or something like that. And so uh, this whole world of my smart things that you're seeing here in the app is complemented by, um, you know, if I press the right button there, is complemented by a world of all of the recommended ways that you can use this type of experience in your life from our community of developers, from our community of makers and, and innovators. And so you can come in and understand how to manage my climate using an, an Ecobee Wi-Fi connected uh, uh, thermostat as an example, or how do I have a better garage door, et cetera, et cetera. And so one of the interesting smart apps that uh, somebody actually built uh, for us was uh, they simply, they took a Twilio integration uh, and they, you know, basically said, so if all, you know, switches on. And, you know, we'll send that in. And so they just did a very basic Twilio integration. That's going to go up to Twilio and it's going to come back and turn on my light. And somebody built that in a couple of hours based on the Twilio system. And you can imagine any of these additional systems that start to bring the power of these connected devices mm -hmm. together. So. Okay. I'm going to cut you off because yep. we're going to run short on time. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart, okay. want to jump into it? Sure. Uh, so my, my demo is going to be the least exciting demo. Um, uh, it, because really what we're focused on is, is how do we make it really easy for you to conserve energy and save money? Um, and obviously, as you know, the mobile device is becoming you know, the moral control of your life. So you know, this is my house. And we'll wait for it just change the temperature. Um, and that's about it. Because for most people, the interaction they want to have with their thermostat is really, really simple, right? It's just turn it up, turn it down. And so we're really, really focused on how do we create that super simple user experience. Behind, there's a lot of complexity because we can use the power of the internet to make much smarter decisions for you. Because our device is connected, because we know about things like weather, because we learn the way your home performs, because we can optimize for comfort when you're home um, and energy savings uh, when you're not, 
we can save you a lot of money. So our average consumer is saving about 24% on their heating and cooling costs, um, which is a big deal. But one of the things that I'm most excited about is the data that we collect. So we collect all kinds of data on hundreds of thousands of homes across North America and how they perform. And the reality is homes in North America perform totally, totally differently. Um, and we believe we can give you about 80% of the value of an in-home energy audit just from, the, just from the data that we collect. So if you've got a 2,000 square foot home built in 1960, how the heck do you know how energy efficient it is? Um, and one of the great values of our product is we believe we can give you some of those values and that insight to allow you to make smarter decisions, help you again conserve energy, save more money. Um, I think um, you know, one of the really interesting things also is you know, how do you enable uh, ecosystems? And so, um, like smart things, we believe very strongly in enabling partners to build applications on top of our uh, platform. Um, so integrating with smart things, for example, um, you know, is a great thing. So we have public APIs, so you can do that as well. So that's my demo. That's great. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Keller, well, wanna sure. Show um, the so Romo fell asleep, uh, so I can wake him up by, by just swiping. So I'll show a couple of quick things. Um, I'm just gonna borrow your table, Andrew. Sure. So when, um, when Romo wakes up, he is in face follow mode, which means that we can actually use, uh, we can use the camera on the device, and he's actually using computer vision to basically follow my face wherever I move. So I can, if I let him see me, I can come over here and he'll follow. I can come up, oh, I'm a little too close. Here we go. Now if I get too close, he'll tell me I'm too close and ask me to back off. Um, oh. And then if I want to control them, I can control them from any smart device. So I can go on here and just open up the free remote app. I, and it actually streams video to this device. I don't know if, if you can see that. But you can actually see everything. So I, I can wave to Romo and it's streaming um, really low latency video uh, to this robot. And then I can control them. And the cool thing is this, I, this uh, iPad can be anywhere in the world right now. So. I can literally uh, drive Romo around on the stage, seeing everything that he sees. Uh, and then if I want, I can look up and down just by swiping on the screen in the same way that you would like scroll through content on an iPad, you can look up and down. Um, and even cooler actually is sometimes Romo goes too fast and he'll, he accidentally, whoop, he'll kind of flip himself over. But if he does that, he uses the sensor on the phone to know it and he can flip himself back over. Um, so I can actually take pictures with Romo. Video is coming soon, so I can take a picture of all of you guys, and then I can make faces with him, so I can make Romo fall in love. Um, and what's so cool right now is that we're working on a bunch of different things in terms of computer vision. So our, uh, our goal is to create a robot that knows who you are, that can use face recognition to, the, to tell the difference between different human beings, and then use smile and frown recognition so that Romo actually knows how you're feeling based on what your face looks like. So if you think about it, this is the dream of, this is what toys should be. The magic of Toy Story was that uh, every kid on the planet thinks of their toy as knowing who they are, caring about them, and being able to empathize with them. And what made Toy Story magical was you know, it, it created a, a, a dream where that's actually the case. Romo is the first product that, where, where that dream can actually become a reality in our minds. Uh, and, what really motivates us in terms of what we're doing is that right now, you know, we're mainly focused on building robots for, uh, for kids because uh, kids go nuts for Romo and it's, he's super easy to use um, I, and, and program, but the goal for us really is to build a robot that anyone can train. Uh, so I can show you really quickly, uh, if, if in terms that we wanted to build, so most, most robots out there that have SDKs or they say, oh, you know, anybody can program it, but you really need like, to have deep expertise in software and hardware to do that, um, we think that sucks. And so if you want to program Romo, you can actually just swipe on his forehead. Here are all the different modes. Here, I guess I'll push him up here so we can see on the camera. So um, he has a whole bunch of different modes. If I want to create a new mode, I can just click Create. Um, and we'll, we can call it, um, oh, we'll just call it uh, Keller, I guess. And we'll say Next. And we can actually just using these if-then clauses, we can say, OK, if Romo sees a face appear, I want him to, let's say, take a picture. And then if Romo sees a face disappear, I want him to act sad. And then if I pick Romo up, I want Romo to act angry. So really quickly, you can create a unique personality for Romo. Um, and then we can just click Start. 
and run it. So I think, so we said when Romo sees my face appear, so he just took my picture, I'll get out of his way. He said Romo's gonna act sad. And then when I pick him up, he's angry. So what's so cool about this is as we add more inputs and outputs, you can, you can quickly create this whole universe of personalities and functionalities for robots that, that uh, kids and adults alike can program. And so our, our vision for the future is really that um, robots are this great unfulfilled promise of science fiction. And, and we think that the reason that robots suck today is they're largely built by huge corporations that are out of touch with um, with people who would actually want robots in their home. And so we think that if we're going to actually create innovation in robotics, we have to get, in the same way that you, know, you were talking about, Andrew, we have to get maker, like the maker community, and, and uh, you know, a 14-year-old who is programming her robot in her garage on the weekend, or, uh, uh, or inventors, we have to basically open it up to everybody. And so the goal of Romo is to, uh, is, is to build a robot that costs $150 that does a lot of what the most advanced robots do in research settings today. So. That's great. Thanks yeah. for that demo. Yeah. Um, Keller, since you talked about uh, com um, computer vision at least a few times uh, here in, in, in backstage, why don't we talk... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's angry. He doesn't like the right. question. Um, <laughs> why don't we talk about uh, what are the advances in, in computer vision and, and active and passive sensors that are really going to drive the next generation of technologies for, uh, for Romo and, and other types of uh, home-connected products? Sure. Um, actually, you know, I won't control it here. Does, who, who wants to drive a robot? You can drive them up on stage. I'll just hand you the iPad. Does anybody want to try it? It's really simple. You don't have to be scared. Nobody wants to drive. I've never heard no, nobody wants to drive a robot. OK, there you go. So here, I'll actually give you an even better controller. Here you go. Oh, you own one? Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> um, OK, so whoa. <laughs> here, we'll put, we'll put him down here. I think he should still be working. Is he still working? Here. <laughs> so this is why we do a ton of testing to make sure that Romo can be thrown around. There you go. Okay, got it. All right. Um, so, so in terms of the advance, so we're really of the opinion in robotics in general that um, over the last 10 or 15 years, I, the, the, in, in the mobile and the internet space, so much of the, the uh, innovation has come from design, basically, and, and just good product sense, basically making technology available to millions of people in the world. And fascinatingly, in robotics, the exact opposite is true. There's been, a ton of there's been a ton of technological innovation, but almost no design innovation. So you have, in, in our opinion, most of the technology is there, like in terms of computer vision, in terms of sensors. Um, right now in robotics, we really need companies that are going in and figuring out how do we actually make it robust? How do we make, for example, Romo, when we test him, and this is, we just showed by him running off the stage, when we test him, we throw him up 10 feet into the air and let him slam down on concrete. Because this is what it's going to take to build a robot that people can actually have in their homes that will live with them and stand up to the abuse that normal people will put their products through. Um, and so we just think, so I think the technology is there. It's really a question of getting people focused on design and usability and, and, and building technology that is actually robust enough to live in people's homes. Got it. And then if we, uh, Stuart, Andrew, if we look at the home environment, are there, do you have access to the ecosystem of sensors and, and technology that you actually need in the home to be able to plug in and control everything? I mean, I think there's, uh, there's thousands of connected devices that exist today across the standards, right? And, uh, but they tend to fall in the categories of the obvious sensors, right? The things like contact sensors and accelerometers and motion sensors and CO2 sensors and, or carbon monoxide sensors. And so part of the, the strategy to build an open platform is that who knows who's going to create the next happy fork, which was the CES darling of basically a fork with an accelerometer in it, which would shake in your mouth if you're, if you're eating too fast. It's that sort of connected device that I don't think it exists yet, uh, but the, as consumers start to adopt these technologies, will. Got it. Yeah, I think, uh, I think two things. One is, one is the price points, right? So the, the fact that the price points are coming down, internet connected is no longer like a, you know, an expensive option. It, it's actually, you get it for free, right? So if you look at it in our space, the way the price points are coming down, why would you ever buy a not internet connected thermostat? Because the price difference right now is probably 20 or 30 bucks, and you know a couple of years from now it'll be zero, right? So you're going to buy it. And then I think you know the point that Keller made is is that you know we're in heating and cooling, and when you say thermostats, when we started the business, you know people's eyes would roll into the back of their heads, and and, and you know I think a lot of people thought we were crazy for kind of embarking on this uh, on this journey, but there really hasn't been any design in a lot of these home automation products. And so I think when you add that design capability 
into these home automation products, you know, it changes the way people see them, it changes your relationship, it's something that goes in your home, um, it's something special, like why not? Why shouldn't it be designed? It's on my wall next to, you know, all those other things that I put in my house that I cherish and all those other, other types of things. Got it. So it's interesting, all three of you have the smartphone as the central intelligence in addition to your cloud services associated with your, uh, your products as the hub of, uh, call it the connected home or, or robotics. So um, do you still see it as going to be the smartphone moving forward? And it, is there a risk for you personally in your business of making the dependence on an iPhone, for example, as opposed to having it be some other computing device down the road? I mean, certainly for smart things right now, you just saw the demo and it, and it looks very uh, phone centric, but at the end, that was a little bit of a, a hack to use Siri's voice control to, to, to turn off the lights, but it's an indication that certainly voice control is going, to, is going to happen. I think gesture is going to be a big part of this as things like leap motion and your Xbox controllers are everywhere. Uh, and then ultimately for us, it's, it's about how do you move the intelligence out of the actual human having to interact at all, and what's the cloud able to do from a software software intelligence standpoint to be predictive, to know that uh, when I come downstairs in the morning, this is what the state of the home and the, and the environment should look like so that I don't actually have to take control. And then I think the device starts to become a notification and, and, and comfort engine. It's comfortable for me to know that my children have left for school on time and have arrived home from school on time. So I think it starts to become a notification tool. Got it. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think the state of the universe today is, is, is mobile is, you know, is critical, critical to our customers. And if you look at the mobile interaction versus any other type of interaction with our products, uh, it's about three to one. And about a third of our customers actually use their mobile application on any given day. Um, and so you get uh, quite a bit of, of interaction. You know, as you get more sensors, as you get more intelligence, as I know more about you, um, you know, being predictive, I think, can make that experience better and easier. Um, but I think ultimately the other thing about mobile is having something with, with you so I know where you are, how long it's going to take you before you get home, those right. types of things um, also make a big, big difference. So I, I don't see it going away, that's for sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll venture, I guess. I, I mean, so I, I think when we say dependent on, cell, on, on smartphones, I, um, I don't know, does, 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 do heads up displays count as mobile? I think they should count as mobile. But I think people are, I, I, my suspicion is that, um, is that, in the same way that it took so much work to figure out how to make the technology that we had you know, in a browser work on a mobile phone, it's going to take that same amount of simplification again to make apps work on, uh, to make apps work on heads-up displays like Google Glass. And I also think that, I mean, we're excited about Google Glass because heads-up displays are great for robots. Like, I think that eventually robots will allow you to basically lead multiple lives at once via a heads-up display where you're just controlling that robots. That would be a good thing. <laughs> I, 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 I think I, I, my, I would venture that that's the future, and I also think that um, I think that heads-up displays will, will become huge really, really fast. And, and so whether we classify that as mobile or not, I'm not sure. But when you talk to your users um, outside of price points, what do you think are the barriers to widespread adoption? So everybody in the audience would have the types of services and, and uh, products that you're offering. Is it uh, is it a geek factor? Are people afraid of the technology? Is it uh, purely price, or is it awareness? Is there something else? When, when we ran that, uh, the survey and asked people to answer the question, wouldn't it be smart if, and then fill in the blank, we got these very, very emotional things. Like I said, like the dog who they, they wanted to comfort uh, when there was a thunderstorm, or they, they think in terms of, I want, uh, I want my uh, aging parent to live in place longer. And I think certainly for the technologies that we touch at, at SmartThings right now, Historically, they've been presented in very tactical, very um, non-emotional use cases, right? A contact sensor is to know if a cabinet is, or op is open or closed versus uh, you have a, uh, a, an aging parent, we need to know whether or not the medicine cabinet was open at the appropriate time and is the, the light in her, in her home uh, appropriate because she took the blinds up and, and you know, is, the, is the air fresh, et cetera. Um, that starts to be much more of an emotional appeal, and so I think adoption is going to come as, as, as people are characterizing these technologies in a very emotional way where it's solving a life problem rather than it's a, it's a, it's a technical spec that, that can do a certain function. I think a lot of it's about awareness, right? And, and I'm sure uh, everyone here has probably heard of Nest, and, and I think Nest was one of the best things that ever happened to our business because it really created a uh, much more buzz in the marketplace, um, and certainly much more than we could have done, you know, in and of ourselves. So awareness is, is certainly critical. And then I think, you know, what we think about in our business is, um, is what's my opportunity cost, right? And so when you're at a $200 price point, um, you know, I can buy a Kindle Fire for 200 bucks. 
And so people in this room might not make that decision, but if you really want to get mass adoption, you know, people are going to make that decision that when it starts creeping up north of $200, um, then they start looking at their opportunity costs and they're like, okay, well, you know, maybe I should get a Kindle Fire instead of my Ecobee. And so I think cost is the other thing that we're working really, really hard on. Got it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think there are, I, 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 hopefully there are no barriers. We're almost 150 bucks on our website. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think actually the barrier is just that, especially in the US, it's interesting, there's a difference between the US and Europe and also in Asia. In Europe and Asia, people are, love, like, are bonkers for robots, basically. Um, in the US, I think we're a little disillusioned. It's, when I look at like, science fiction from the 1950s, we were like, as obsessed with robots uh, as anyone else. But I think in the US especially, we've kind of felt as though some kinds of technology are just fundamentally out of our grasp. It feels like that kind of happened with the space program also, which is why we really admire Elon and what he's doing at SpaceX. But we're very much of the opinion that that's not a good excuse to not try to go build stuff. Um, and so I think that for us, the challenge is really just saying that it's, it's fighting that cynicism of like, oh man, well, you know, yeah, when I watched Star Wars, like I thought that you know, a robot was gonna make my life awesome, but that, that's not the case. They're too complicated, et cetera, et cetera. And we're, we're, we really are of the opinion like that isn't the case. Uh, robots can make people's lives fundamentally better if they're designed in ways uh, uh, that allow them to do so. Got it. We're, uh, we're going to be running short on time, so we just have time for a couple questions from the audience. So I'm going to open it up. I'm curious, especially as, as you guys are kind of going with things that are really kind of on the, I mean, even relative to, to, to tr traditional startups, you're really pushing the boundaries on things that, that you know, have huge potential market opportunity with very little legacy of anything that, that a traditional venture capitalist could, could point to and say that's successful. How was that when you were going out and trying to raise money on stuff? Intensive, it's got all these market dynamics. I mean, it's not like these other things where you're kind of slightly tweaking a more traditional business model. Was everyone able to hear the question, by the way? Is it? No, so I, I can rephrase. Yeah, the question is just that uh, when, you're, when you're working on things that obviously have huge potential markets but are totally different and there's basically no uh, precedent for what you're doing, is it harder to raise money? Or how does, how does raising money work? Um, for us, we, uh, you know, I, we started Remote of a year and a half ago, and we said, we basically went and we started talking to investors and said, we really want to build a, a robot uh, you know, that anybody could use that was simple, you'd use a smartphone as its brain. And these people basically told us it was a terrible idea, no one's going to buy it, it's too complicated, you guys aren't smart enough to do it, um, it's just a toy, and do people really need personal robots anyway? Um, and interestingly, a, a couple months later, we actually got to, got to hang out with Steve Wozniak, and he was like, oh, don't worry, that's exactly what they said about the personal computer um, when he was talking to investors, which was, it's just a toy, and do people really need personal computers anyway? Um, I think you just get a different kind of investor, is the simple, like, the, for us, in terms of building robots, uh, when we raised our seed round, I was, you know, I was 25, my co-founders were 25 and 22, maybe 21, actually. We had no credibility, and... Investors basically wrote us checks and said, I'm make, marking this as zero in my checkbook. I expect you to swing for the fences. Mm. And that's actually an awesome thing to hear from investors, by the way, because I know that like, the only way that I can disappoint them is just by, by, by selling out or not doing like, what, what we believe is the future. So I think that that's the kind of investor that you have to go seek out if you want to do something, if you want to build hardware, or if you want to build robots, or if you want to you know, automate a home. Um, just because there is no precedent, and if investors are just trying to make a quick like turn return on their investment, they'd be stupid to invest in hardware. I think we we, uh, we launched our project um, on Kickstarter, uh, actually not to to raise capital, but to connect with the community. And one of the interesting data points for us is we got featured on CNN over the weekend, uh, and a massive number of the the folks who backed us on Kickstarter came in on the back of that media exposure. CNN is pretty broad base. 40% uh, of those backers were all first time ever coming to Kickstarter, so they're not just the enthusiasts that are out there stroking checks every time to, to every new idea. And it was definitely an indicator that people are ready for these types of capabilities in their life. They want to see this happen. Uh, we have some precedent in the home automation space that there are existing systems that are ludicrously expensive that, uh, that can be brought down and, and appeal to a wider audience. And I think uh, you know, one of my favorite um, experiences a couple days ago, my son came in and said, Andrew, the, or Dad, he didn't say Andrew, uh, he said, uh, Dad, the, uh, uh, the, the, your smart things is broken. 
Um, and I was like, what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about? And certainly, we've, we've managed to introduce software bugs into the physical world occasionally. That's, uh, that's happened. But uh, uh, he was like, the light's not coming on uh, in here. And I went in, and, and the bulb was out, right? And so for him, he's already, uh, he's already adapted to a world where I'm expecting this world to, to react around me. And I, and I expect that you know, the, the, generationally, that's going to be the case. <laughs> I, uh, he's, uh, he's what we call spoiled. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd echo what, uh, what Keller said. You have to find the, the right investors. We were actually really lucky in that, in that Relay Ventures was a, was a really early in, investor in our company, and, and they've been really uh, you know, great and strong believers, which has been, has been really great for us. We had a really hard time at the beginning, like trying to get people interested. Um, but now, when you look at the metrics, you look at the rate of connected devices coming online, when you, you know, we're connecting devices six times faster now than we were just three months ago. Like the acceleration in terms of you know, the connectivity of devices, you don't have people saying like, why would I ever want to do that? People are like, oh yeah. I mean, you know, when we started, the, we, we, we started the company about the same time that the iPhone launched, right? And, and, and so, you know, but now with the, you know, with, the, with the mobile generation, with the iPhone, the iPod, Android phones, all that kind of stuff, it's like, when you talk to people, it's like, oh yeah, why wouldn't I? Like, the other way is so stupid. Why, why would I spend, you know, whatever it is, $79 on, a, on, a, on something that's not internet connected, that can't do these things for me, that can't help me save money? Um, so the whole um, paradigm of how you talk to consumers has changed. And, um, and I think that's the opportunity for VCs is to, you know, what are these new models that are different than what we were doing three or five years ago? Um, I'm getting the cue. We're uh, out of time, so no more questions. But uh, I want to thank all the panelists and uh, uh, really appreciate it.